Happy Sabbath. How's everybody doing? All right. We're here, right? Amen. All glory to God. Uh, we could be anywhere else. We could be at home just relaxing, watching TV, right? But we're here to praise God. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Y'all keep my wife in prayer. She's not feeling good. She's at home. But uh, we're here. We're here to celebrate Jesus Christ and what he means to us, right? He, Jesus Christ loves you very much, and he wants to help you out, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through. Amen. Welcome to Christian Lighthouse Church. Uh, you might be saying, well, why do we have church on Saturday? It's a little bit different, right? But um, the Bible talks about the Ten Commandments. And the fourth commandment says to keep the Sabbath holy. Amen. So um, the Bible says over and over, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus says. You know, it's easy for us to say I love you to somebody. It's another thing to show them that you love them. Amen. And that's what that's what Jesus tells us. If you really love me, keep my commandments. And uh, there's ten commandments. The fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath holy. Amen. So that's all we're doing is we're having um, service here on Saturdays. Y'all invite people to come. Um, sometimes we have a full church. Sometimes we only have a few people here. But regardless, we're here to praise God. Amen. We're not here about. We're not worried about numbers. We're not worried about competition. We're just here to teach what the Bible says and what God has for us. So welcome to Christian Lighthouse Church. We come before you as we come to worship you, as we come to praise you, Father. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit be here with each person. May they fill this place up, may they fill this church up, Father. And Father, we ask prayer for anybody that's going through anything. You know what each person is going through. And Father, we just ask that you answer their prayer, Lord. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Welcome, welcome to Christian Lighthouse Church. Um, at this time, we're going to have uh, Brother Mark. He's going to pass the tray around. And we're going to be giving, uh, returning our tithes and offerings. If you have anything to give, you may do so at this time. If you don't, it's okay. Next Saturday, we're going to have a special guest as a speaker here. So if y'all can show him support, it's going to be Pastor Jesse. Um, so y'all can help him out because um, he wasn't able to make it here today because he had somebody pass away in his family. But uh, we're going to have a special guest next Saturday. Uh, so if y'all can help him out and help him... Uh, for it to be smooth for him to, to run the service. Um, he's a powerful speaker, and uh, he's been a pastor for a while. So next Saturday, y'all don't want to miss it. We're going we're gonna to have a special guest as a speaker up here. All right. Also, keep my wife in prayer. She's not feeling good. She's at home. All right, let us pray for the tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray for this, uh, this money that was given and was returned, Father. We ask that it goes to where it needs to go and that you bless it, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. God is good, right? All the time. All the time. God is good. I'm so excited. I can't wait for Saturdays. Every, every week, I can't wait for Saturdays. I, I, I look forward to it. You know, uh, what's coming up soon that everybody celebrates? Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, right? And uh, most jobs, not all of them, but most jobs give you that day off, right? Well, did y'all know that God gives you a day off every week? And it's called the Sabbath. It's a holy day. That's where we get the word holiday from. The world takes what belongs to God and makes it their own thing, right? But God gives us a holy day every Saturday and says, take it easy. Don't work. Just relax and be filled with the presence of God. Amen? So that's what the Sabbath is about. It's not so much, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. You know, yeah, God, 
God tells us to not work on the Sabbath because he wants your full attention. Amen. We praise God every day, even Sundays. We praise God every day. But the Bible says that the seventh day is holy, right? And therefore, we need to come apart from the world and just relax. Take it easy. Don't have to cook big meals on the Sabbath. If you are going to cook a big meal, make sure you have plenty of help. Because the Bible says you don't want to make it a burden. You don't want to overwork yourself on the Sabbath. All right. But God is good. God will always make a way. Um, we have, we're going to have Vanessa now. She's going to be doing uh, the children's story. You want to sit right there, they can come up here. You're going to have to speak loud enough, or do you need a mic? All right. Amen. At this time, we're going to have special music by Don. All right. All right, Don. Um, before we get to the special music, you want to let us know what this song means and what it's about. This song is a. Uh, it's really touched my heart. Uh, I used to uh, be in the 12 tribes uh, of the new Israel, which is out. Uh, it's worldwide now, but uh, anyway, I'm out here. Uh, and it's uh, all this uh, Israeli music has really led me to, I love, led me to where I, I just love Israeli uh, music, well, drumming. 
and I've, I've learned uh, Latin percussion, I uh, play the drums, I've, I've, all of it and everything, but uh, I kind of took on Israeli music as well, and um, so I'm going to try and encourage you by this song, and hopefully, uh, oh, also, Pastor Carlos wanted me to share with everybody, if anybody doesn't have a place to go on Thursday, that they can come on Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to have it here. Yo, so for those of y'all that don't, don't, don't know what Israel, Israelite music is, we're all Israelites. How many of y'all were last here last Saturday? We're spiritual Israelites. We're spirit, spiritual Jews. The Bible says that if uh, we, we are of Christ, then we are spiritual Jews. Amen? We are Jewish. So it's not so much Jewish by race, but spiritually Jewish because... Jesus was Jewish. Amen. So if we belong to Christ, we are part of the family of God. Amen. So this this song or this music that he's going to be doing, it's Israelite music and um, all glory to God. Amen. <laughs> amazing you know God gives us so many talents and one of those was not for me <laughs> I don't have the, uh, the talent or the gift of singing or playing any kind of instrument but uh, all glory to God that was amazing brother thank you so much I really blessed my heart <laughs> and um, that's that's amazing you know there's different cultures around the world there's different styles of different ways of praising God right as long as it's all in honor and glory to God. The message today, my daughter stole my message today. <laughs> I didn't let her know what I was going to be preaching about. I'm going to be preaching about Jonah. And my, the title of the message is called, Say Who? Isn't that, isn't that crazy? How the Lord kind of puts everything together. Uh, she, uh, she told a children's story about Jonah. And so my sermon is about Jonah, but let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, I want to invite your Holy Spirit to speak through me. I want to invite you to uh, give me the words to say 
for all of us, including myself, speak through it, speak to us through your word, through your Bible. And we just ask that the Holy Spirit will remove any distractions, will remove the enemy and his demons away from this place, that we may be filled by your Holy Spirit. We want to thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible's the Bible is awesome, right? The Bible is powerful. We are to be called Christians. We are to be followers of Christ. Amen. But we are to be known by the Word of God, what the Word of God has for us. Um, there's different translations. You have the NIV. You have the King James. You have the New King James, the American Standard, and so many others, right? I like to stick closer to the King James. I have the New King James. But um, sometimes as time goes on and, and different and, uh, you know, time goes ahead of us, right? And new translations are added to the word of God. But we got to be careful, be careful, because sometimes they, they remove or change the meaning on some, on some of the words that the Bible tells us. So we want to stay closer to the original, right? But the Bible is powerful and the Bible was inspired by God, as holy man, wrote the Bible. Amen? You have the, the first five books of the Bible, which were written by Moses. Moses wrote those first five books of the Bible. And then you have other writers. You have John, you have Peter, you have James, you have Isaiah, you have... Um, you have so many different writers. There's a vibration over here, so like... <laughs> There's so many different writers, right? But God used them all. And did you know that all these writers lived in different time periods throughout this life? And yet, they don't contradict each other. Amen? They don't contradict each other. What Moses wrote in the Old Testament and what John wrote in the book of Revelation, they don't contradict each other. That's how we know that... God inspired this book, this Bible. It's not just any regular book, right? Moses lived thousands of years before John did. Moses lived way before, like, you know, a little bit after the flood, right? And then you had John that lived during the time of uh, Rome. So you had all these empires coming through. You had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, then Rome. And Rome was divided into ten kingdoms, which made Europe. And then Europe spread out, and now we have the United States, right? So we have all these kingdoms that have happened, and people in different time periods in the Bible that wrote the Bible, some in the Old Testament and some in the New Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek with a little bit of Aramaic. Two different languages. Yet, yet they don't contradict each other. That's how we know that it's inspired by God. The Bible is inspired by God. Amen. So here we have the story of Jonah. How many of y'all know that you are a chosen people? We are a chosen people, amen? You might be saying, well, what do you mean, Pastor Juan? We are chosen because God has chosen us from the world. God has chosen us from that dark, sinful world, amen? That's the only reason we're chosen. He's calling us out of sin. He's calling us out of darkness and out of this whole mess that's all around us, amen? This world is full of darkness and sin. You don't even have to turn the TV on anymore. It's all around us, right? It's at work. It's at home. It's with the family. It's with the children. I I don't know how old any of y'all are. I'm not going to ask you your age. Amen? <laughs> but I'm 43 years old. And I remember when I was 18. I remember when I was 18. I was wild myself. But I remember there was more respect towards the elderly. I remember there was more respect towards pastors and, and people 
you know, even with the bosses at work. Amen. There was so there was, it was way different. Now it's like it's a whole totally different generation. Amen. Everything's changing. But the Bible says that this planet is going to produce birth pains. Amen. We, what does that mean? Well, when a woman's pregnant, right? She has uh, birth pains. As it gets closer to her having her baby, the contractions get stronger. Amen. So this planet, right before Jesus comes, this world's going to get worse. Amen. This world's going to get worse and things are going to intensify. People's hearts are going to grow colder. People are not going to care no more. People are not going to respect nobody no more. I mean, it's just going to get worse. Amen. But we don't have to fall in that category. That's why God chooses you. God chooses everybody. God wants to choose everybody out of this, this mess. Amen. And he's calling all of us to, to he's calling us to repentance. Amen. You don't hear that in the churches anymore. For us to repent of our sinful ways. Amen. You don't hear that in the churches no more. Why? Because if they preach that, we'll have this many people in the church. Amen. I can sit here and yell on top of my lungs. I can run up and down the aisles. I can have a good praise and worship team and fill this church up and never preach repentance. But that's not what I'm called. We're not called to do. Amen. We are here to teach the truth and the whole truth. God wants us to call us from sin and from our sinful ways. Amen. So here we're going to read about here in a minute. We're going to read about Jonah. But Jonah was a chosen man of God as well. He had a purpose for him. God has a purpose for all of you here today. You, you might say, well, I'm just a simple person. No, you're not a simple person because Jesus is king. That means you're a prince or a princess for Jesus. Amen. So in royalty, right? In royalty, we are a chosen people. We have a mission. We have a purpose, right? We're not just anybody. When you're chosen by God, when you're chosen by Jesus, you're not just anybody. Those, those talents, Brother Don, that God is using through you, you're bringing honor and glory to God. Amen. And every person here today, Amen. Let's go to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. If you don't have a Bible with you, you want to write these Bible verses down and read them later, that's fine as well. But let's go to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. I'm old school. I preach from the Word of God. I preach from the Bible. Like I said, I'm not just here to motivate you. I'm here to teach what the Word of God says. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called, us, he called you out of what? Darkness. darkness into his marvelous light. It's his light, not our light. I'm not here to brag, oh, I'm a pastor. We're not here to brag, I'm a Christian and I'm better than you. No, we're all this together, right? We are to tell others that there's a better way. And that way is Jesus Christ. It says his light, not my light, not your light, right? It's his light. He's calling us out of darkness. Therefore, we're a chosen generation. Amen. Here we have a man named Jonah. I know many of y'all probably heard this story. Well, we just did it this morning by Vanessa. But uh, many of us have heard this story about Jonah. But we're going to break it down and see what God is trying to tell us through this story. Amen? Let's go to the book of Jonah. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time. Let's go to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. I believe it's one of the shortest book in the Bible. I might be mistaken, but it's pretty short. There's only there's only four chapters. The book of Jonah. Let's go to Jonah chapter one, verse one through three. 
Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city that cry out against and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Amen. So God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, I need you to do something for me. Y'all got to understand, Jonah was a prophet. It wasn't just, you know, you could say he was an elder in the church or maybe even a, a preacher, right? Because Jonah would go to all his people and say, God is telling me to tell you this, right? God is saying we need to stop doing these things or we need a, God has commanded us to do these things for God, right? That's what Jonah was. He was a prophet. So, so God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, I need you to do something. There's a city called Nineveh. There's a city called Lubbock. There's a city called Dallas. There's a city called Oklahoma, right? I need you to go to that city. It's full of wickedness. It's full of evil. I need you to go warn them that they need to turn from their evil ways. Amen? God doesn't just want us to motivate people, but God wants us to teach people. And God wants us to lead people to God. Right? He wants us to say, okay, I know that you're a sinner. But if you continue in that sin, you will be lost. Amen? We have to tell them in love, of course. Not in arrogance, not in pride. Oh, I'm better than you are because I'm a Christian and you're not. No, never like that. Because what did Jesus do to the prostitute in, uh, in the book of Matthew? He said, I don't condemn you. You know, I'm not here to condemn you. But he says, go and sin no more. Jesus tells Mary Magdalene, go and sin no more. And that's what we should have is the attitude when we come to people, show them love. Show them that you care for them. But also, don't forget the other part. And say, you know what? God wants you to repent from those things. He wants you to live a life for Jesus. Amen? And He wants you to, for us to take that step of faith. And then Jesus will change you. Jesus will do the change in us. Amen? If you try to change on your own, you will never do it. It's only Jesus that can change you, amen? But you have to take that first step of faith, right? That first step of faith in saying, I repent from my, from my sinful ways. You have to want Jesus. Jesus will never force himself on you. God, Jesus is a, a gentleman. Jesus is a respecter. He respects, amen? He will never force you to love him. He will invite you. He will show you his love towards you, but he will never force you to love him back. That's how much God loves us. Amen. That's how much Jesus loves us. God is a God is amazing. So Jonah says, I don't want to go to the to those people. They're crazy. Nothing but gangsters and druggies and alcoholic people and all they do is swear. Every other word is a swear word. I don't want to go to those people. Send me to Jerusalem or send me over here where God's people are at. Right? Send me to another church. You know, a lot of pastors are so ready to preach at another church. But when you call them to go preach in the streets, like, then all the excuses come, right? You know, God was calling this preacher or this prophet, Jonah, Go to these people, this sinful people, this city. I need you to go to them. And Jonah said, heck no. <laughs> said, Charlie, no way, man. <laughs> said, I'm not going to go to them. I'm going to go the opposite direction. So he went and paid a, a boat, a ship. And he paid them money and says, take me to Tarshish. 
the opposite direction of where God wants me to go to that city of Nineveh. And he paid them, and he took off. He ran away from God. Amen? Has the Lord ever called you to do something out of your comfort zone? You know, it's, it's not easy sometimes. Being a Christian is not easy. That's why we're called soldiers for Christ. Amen? It's a battlefield. You're going to be attacked left and right, not just from the world, but from your family sometimes. Sometimes from those closest to you. Because now they see that you're different. And it bothers them that you're different. You would think they would be excited for you that you're living for God now. But it bothers them that now you're living for God. And therefore people will attack you. It's not easy being a Christian. Amen? But we have to get out of our comfort zone. And if God is calling you to do something, I don't know what God is calling you to do. Maybe He's calling you to go have a Bible study with somebody. Or go pray with somebody. Or go uh, just take somebody out to eat. Show them that you care, that you love them. Amen? You know, we have to get out of our comfort zone. Who doesn't want to just stay at home under the blankets watching TV? Right? Who doesn't want, just want to chill? Right? But God wants us to get out of our comfort zone and step out for Him and do the work for Him. Amen? God is awesome. So we know that Jonah was running away from God. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1, 4, and 6. It says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, and that the ship was about to be broken up. And then verse 6, So the captain came to him, came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish or die. Right? You know that when we give our lives to God, God is with you everywhere you go, right? God is with us. His angels are with us. Amen? Have you ever, have you ever served God for a while? And then you decided to go back into the world. You go back into the world. You go back to the clubs. You go back to just whatever it may be, right? All the sinful things that are out there. And you know, in the back of your mind, you know that you were walking with the Lord. And you know that you can't even get into the music like you used to back then. Because you already tasted what the Lord is, right? Right? You already tasted what it means to be a child of God. Amen? I know I did. I went back into the world. I was serving God for many years, and I said, I'm going to go back into the world. This is not for me. The people in the church are nothing but hypocrites. All they do is look down at me. Because you got to stop and think about it. Back then, I had long hair to right here. I had black eyeliner. I used to dress into heavy metal. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was uh, I was into witchcraft. I was into all kinds of mess. I was a womanizer. I was a you know that was that was terrible. I was into all this mess, and somebody invited me to the church. Right? I started going to church. I started praising God. But did you know that a third of the church? wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't want nothing to do, do with me. They would, uh, they would uh, make fun of me in the church. And instead of showing me love, instead of guiding me into the ways of God, right? But I let that distract me. I was serving God and I was going to church. And I let that distract me and I went back to the world. I said, I don't want nothing to do with the church. I don't want nothing to do with Christians because all they do is if you don't look like them, they won't accept you. They want you to look like them, right? But Jesus was there for everybody, right? He was there for the outcast. I'm not talking about the hip hop outcast. <laughs> I'm talking about the outcast. The people that nobody wanted to nothing to do with them, right? 
God loves everybody because we are his creation. No matter how lost you are, no matter how lost and how down you are, he loves you, right? He loves you very much. You can be the sinner of the sinners, right? You know God loved even Hitler. God loved Hitler. It broke his heart. It broke his heart what Hitler decided to do, right? It breaks his heart when he sees you at your lowest point. When God sees you at your, low, at your lowest point, you are his creation. So it's going to hurt him. God loves everybody. But of course, he wants to call us to greater things. Amen. So when we go back to the world, when we run away from God, God's not going to leave you alone. God's going to still be tugging at you and say, hey, come back to me. Come back to me, daughter or, or, or son. Come back to me. You were walking with me one time. Come back to me. So you think he was going to leave Jonah alone? No. Jonah decided to run away from God, right? And God said, no, you, you belong to me. You have given your heart to me. Even though you're running away from me, you already belong to me. Amen. And that's like the story of the 99, or the 99, the story of the sheep of the 99, right? Or, or the 100, and one of them's lost, and Jesus goes for that one, right? He could have, Jesus could have easily said, well, I have 99 already. You know, that's plenty. I mean, if, he, if he's lost or she's lost out there, that's his problem, or that's her problem, right? But no, Jesus went after that one one person. Amen. So that's how much God loves everybody. And so he was not going to leave Jonah alone. Here also, we see that the, the people in the boat, they're atheists. They don't believe in God. Did you know there's power? There's power in the way you walk with the Lord. Did you know that you influence other people around you? These people in the boat were atheists and they didn't believe in God. And they see this storm coming and it's not just a regular storm, it's a supernatural storm. Because God sent this storm, amen? Or God allowed this storm to happen. And the people in the boat were like, this is not just any regular storm. And it must have something to do with this man that's on this boat, right? And that's why they say, Jonah, wake up, you sleeper, get up. Why is this happening? You know that there's power in the way you walk with the Lord. People look at you, right? And I know a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't worry about what people think, right? But in a way, we should worry about the, what people think. Because we can either be leading people to Christ or we can be leading them to think that God is not real. Amen. So you can say, I'm a Christian, but are you living as a Christian? Right? So these people knew this man was a man of God. They knew he was running away from God and they say, wake up. Why is this storm happening? What, what's going on? This is not right. Call on your God. Maybe your God will save us. Amen. So we have a job to do as Christians. When people are doubting, when people are in depression, when people are uh, caught on drugs or alcohol, we have the best preaching is by example. Amen? And they're going to see Jesus Christ in you. Amen? And that's what we need to do as Christians. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1 verse 10 through 12. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Amen. The men were afraid, like I said. 
He said, what do we need to do, Jonah? This is getting, this storm is really, you know, y'all can imagine, picture it, the ship going back and forth, the boat, right? You know, fixing to be <coughs> tore up, broken down, right? And they asked Jonah, what do we do? What do we do? And Jonah said, I know all this is happening because of me. If y'all throw me in the ocean, in the sea, it'll stop. And a lot of times, a lot of times we're ready to blame God, right? For the things that we're going through, right? A lot of times we say, well, God, why, why am I going through this? Or why am I going through that? Or why? But have you ever stopped and thought about it? A lot of times it's us. A lot of times it's the mess that we get ourselves into, right? And we're ready to blame God, you know? You know, uh, like I said, God loves the drunk. God loves the homosexual. God loves the liar. God loves people that are caught in addictions and everything, right? God loves a sinner, but hates a sin, right? So God will call us to, to, to repent from sin, right? But if we continue to drink alcohol, what happens? I can't say that word. That we get the, the liver, right? It destroys our liver. And it destroys our health. And then when we're suffering in the bed or whatever, God, why did you, why are you doing this to me? God didn't do it. You did it to yourself, right? When we're out here, uh, like I said, I had, I had a problem of being a womanizer. And I continue, if God called me out of that and I continue to do that, continue to do that, there's diseases out there, right? A lot of times we blame God, but we bring it upon ourselves. The Bible says whatever you, uh, whatever you sow, you will reap, right? So we can't always put the blame on God, amen? And we can't always say the devil made me do it, <laughs> right? But God is calling us to repent, to turn from our evil ways, amen? So let's continue to read. You know, we, it, it's up to us to break generational curses. You know, a lot of things are passed down to us. You know, uh, if your mom had a bad temper, most likely you might have a bad temper, right? If, you're, um, if your dad was an alcoholic, most likely you might be, have tendencies to be an alcoholic. You know, generational curses that are passed down to us but that curse can be broken. That chain can be broken, right? It don't have to continue. It's up to us to, to call on to Jesus and say, I don't want to follow this path that my mom or my great or my grandma or my uncle passed down to me. These are generational curses. And therefore we can pass a blessing to our children rather than a curse. Amen. And therefore it's up to us. To say, God, I need your help. I know that I have a tendency to drink alcohol. I look at a, a Dos Equis draft beer or, or a Bud Light. It looks good to me, right? I mean, it still does. It's that, that's a temptation right there. But I say, what? Get behind me saying, I don't need that to, to bring peace in my life. That's false peace. I only need the peace of Jesus Christ, amen? And some of y'all might say, well, the, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus turned the water into wine? Y'all need to study that carefully. The Bible talks about two kinds of wine, fermented and unfermented. Today, what we have, what, you know, every time we have a party, we have Cokes or, you know, sodas, right? Because that's the main drink. When you go out to eat, you ask for a Coke or a or, or, um, Sprite or whatever, right? Back in those days, their main drink was grape juice. That was what they all looked forward to, is drinking grape juice. And when 
the wedding was happening, they had uh, Jesus turn the water into wine. And they were all excited because even doctors today will tell you that the grape juice has healing. Yep. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. You know, and a lot of people try to say, well, the doctor says, you know, a glass of wine will help my, my, my body, my soul. But it's the grape juice, not the alcohol. It's the healing of the grape juice. That's why when we do the, um, the, the ceremony of the, the communion, and we give the bread, the bread represents the body of Christ, and the blood represents, the grape juice represents the blood of Jesus. There's healing. There's healing in grape juice. A lot of people don't know that. But the Bible talks about unfermented wine and fermented wine. Back then, they would store the wine. The, the word wine, all it means is grape juice. When they translated the Bible into English, they used the word wine to mean grape juice. So what they would store the wine or the grape juice in wine skins. They would store it in there. And, G, and, and the, actually the Bible tells us, don't drink the old wine. Drink the new wine. Why? Because the old wine, if you leave something in a bottle or in the, in the wine skin too long, it becomes alcoholic. It becomes fermented. That's why when Jesus was dying on the cross and he says, I'm thirsty, they gave him sour wine and he refused it. He refused it because it was alcoholic. How can we use alcohol to represent the blood of Jesus? Why would we serve grape juice with alcohol in communion? That'd be a slap to the face of Jesus, right? No, it was non-alcoholic. It was simply grape juice. So in that wedding, when Jesus turned the water into wine, it was simply fresh grape juice. So God, God is awesome. God is awesome. And uh, I already forgot where I was going with this story. <laughs> but Jesus wants us to break away from these generational curses. Amen. And therefore... I, I, oh yeah, back to the, well, I remember now. My, my, one of my biggest temptations is drinking alcohol. But I tell, I tell myself and I call out to God. It says pray. Always pray when you're in, when you're in, in, a, in temptation, right? And also mention Bible verses. Because what did Jesus do when he was tempted? He quoted the, the word of God. He says, it is written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? So we are to um, memorize scriptures that help us with those certain temptations that we may have. Amen? So we need to break those generational curses. Jonah was cast into the ocean. These men say, well, we don't want to die, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and throw you in the ocean, right? In the sea. So they threw him in there. I don't know what was in Jonah's mind. I mean, I don't know what was going on in his mind. I don't know if I could say that. It's throw me in the ocean. <laughs> but he said, cast me in the sea, right? And we know what happens. This giant fish comes and swallows Jonah up. A lot of people say it was a whale. The Bible doesn't say whale. It says a giant fish. So Jonah is now in this giant fish. And this story is true. It's not symbolic. This is a true story. You may say, well, how in the world would somebody survive inside of a, of a fish? Well, how in the world did God split the Red Sea for Moses? Was that symbolic or was that literal? It was literal. Amen? God can do anything, right? If he wants to, uh, whatever miracle he wants to do in your life, he'll do it. We shouldn't doubt what God can do. You know that God made a day stay still for a whole day in the Old Testament? God can do anything He wants. He created us, right? He made this world. So He allowed this giant fish to swallow Jonah up. So now Jonah's in there, right? 
Jonah repents while he's inside this fish. He starts to think about everything that he's doing wrong and how he's running away from God and how he's disobeying God. Amen? Let's think about those people that are locked up in jail, right? People are locked up in jail or prison. And a lot of people say, well, they're only serving God because they have nothing else to do. They're in jail. It, it may be so. It may be so. But God is using that opportunity to, to reach that person. Amen? And we should not forget about them. We should not forget about them because God loves them just as much too. Right? So Jonah is locked up. <laughs> Jonah is in jail. Jonah is in this prison. He's inside this fish. And he's thinking about everything. Because when you're alone and you're locked up, you have plenty of time to think about everything, right? So he's locked up. He's thinking about everything he did. Yes, you know, uh, a lot of people might say, well, he's in jail because he deserves it, right? You know, we, we're quick to point down, point at people and say, well, you, you got that because you deserve it. You know, we, we shouldn't have that attitude, right? We have to show people love. But that's how much God loves you, His grace. That's where grace kicks in, right? He gives you grace. When you ask God for forgiveness, should he, do you deserve to be forgiven? No. But God loves you that much, He says, I'm going to give you my grace, right? When you get pulled over by the police and you broke His law, the law of the land, and he only gives you a warning. That's grace. Amen? Do you get back in your car and peel out and do donuts and take off? No. You're going to get in there, put, make sure you have your seatbelt, put two seatbelts on, turn the blinker on, and go slowly, right? God's grace does not give us permission to break his law. That's what I'm trying to go with this story. That's why the Ten Commandments is God's law. It's his character. Why would we want to break his law? The law doesn't save us, but the law points us to the one that does save us, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So when we sin, we break his Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't kill. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. A lot of us have broken many of these commandments, right? But the fourth one, keep the Sabbath holy. It's a, his commandment as well. All he's asking you is to rest. Don't work on the Sabbath. But yet, some of us choose to break his commandment, right? And when we sin, now we're under the punishment of the law. That's why it says that if you're under grace, you're not under the law. That's what it means. When we are forgiven, when God gives us grace, we are no longer under the law. We're no longer under the punishment of the law. Because to break the law is death. But who died for us? Jesus Christ. That's why he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen? So we cannot throw the Ten Commandments out of the way. We need his law. Amen? It is His grace that saves us. It is Jesus Christ that saves us. But we are to be obedient to His law. God is amazing. We don't deserve to be forgiven, but yet God forgives us. Let's go to Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out into dry land. You might be saying, man, that's pretty gross. <laughs> so Jonah, after he repented, he thought about everything he did. He said, okay, God, I'm not going to run away from you no more. The fish came and spit Jonah out into dry land. And uh, how many of y'all know God is a God of second chances, third chances, 20 chances? God gives us so many chances, right? He's not going to leave us alone. He's going to keep calling out to us. Amen? 
When God speaks to you, we need to be obedient. Amen? God would once again command Jonah to go to the sinful city of Nineveh to warn them. Jonah said what this time? Yes, I'll go this time. <laughs> he don't want to be swallowed by a big fish again, right? <laughs> but no, he said, okay, I'll go. I'll go. Uh, maybe God is asking you to reach out to your family and friends and your neighbors, right? No matter what they're caught up in. Amen? Here the Bible tells us that Jonah, before he even reached the city of Nineveh, before he even got there, he was going along the road, right? I don't know if he was on a, a donkey or a horse or a camel or just walking. <laughs> but he's going to the city of Nineveh, right? And as he's going along his journey, as he's going along the road, there's people approaching him. Like, where are you going, Jonah? I'm going to the city of Nineveh. Well, what, why are you going over there? Well, I'm going to warn them that they need to repent from their sins. So these men would run ahead of Jonah and go to that city and say, Jonah's going to come over here and tell us about God. He's going to tell us that we need to repent, right? And so before Jonah even reaches the city of Nineveh, many of the people began to repent. Before Jonah even got to the city of Nineveh, the whole city already started to repent. That's great news, amen? Actually, the whole city repented. The Bible tells us 120,000 people repented. Can you imagine the whole city repenting? It says that they all put sackcloth on. Sackcloth is a symbol of humility, humbleness. How many of y'all know that the president has to dress in a suit? Anywhere he goes, he has to be presentable, right? Well, here in the, in the Bible, it says even the king of Nineveh, even the president of Nineveh put on sackcloth. Even the king humbled himself and said, we repent from our sinful ways. In those days, they worshipped the, the false god of Dagon. The false god of Dagon, which is the fish god. Pretty crazy, right? That's where we see the fish hats in the Roman Roman Empire. That's the, that's the false god of Dagon. They worshipped the false god of Dagon. And they were just evil. They were, the whole city was evil. I, can, I don't know what city to compare it with. New Orleans, Las Vegas, I don't know. You know, y'all be the judge of that. But this city was so sinful and so bad. And God told Jonah, go warn them. But before Jonah got there, the whole city repented, even the king, even the president, right? They all put sackcloth on. They all removed their, their clothing and said, we were humbling ourselves before God. Amen? 120,000 people. That's how many people were in the city. Every single one of them repented. Do y'all believe God can turn this city around? Amen. But are we waiting for other people to do it? It begins with you. This was one person. Jonah. One person. If each of us would do our job, if each, if each, if each of us went to these people in these streets, not looking down at them, but rather showing them the love of God, this whole city would be turned around. Amen? God can do that. It says, humble yourselves and I will heal your land. Amen? That's what the Bible says. Turn from your wicked ways and I will heal your land. But we must turn from our evil ways, our wicked ways. Amen? We're all sinful. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It just means that the Lord is now working through you. And each day, each day as you confess your sins to God and you tell Him, this is my problem. I have a problem with pornography. I have a problem with lying. A lot of people think that's a small thing. But that's a big thing. 
The Bible says that the devil is the father of lies. Amen. So you might not be a you might not be a person that commits adultery. You might not be a drunkard. You might not be a all these things that we consider really bad, right? But you might be a liar. <laughs> I know a lot of pastors that are liars. And yet they think they're going to be going to heaven. But if they do not repent from their lying, they will not go into heaven. They might lead a lot of people to Christ, but themselves might not go to heaven. I don't want to fall in that category, amen? We will all want to follow what God has for us, amen? God calls us to follow His truth, and it's only through Him that He's going to give us the strength to be able to do these things. And each day, there's going to be a change in you. There's going to be a change in you, and people are going to see that in you. They're like, you're not the same person anymore. I see God in you. I see Jesus in you. Yeah, you're still going to slip up sometimes. You might go drink a drink sometimes. You might be tempted to go smoke. You might be tempted to uh, a curse word comes out here and there. But the more and more, the Lord's going to change that in you. All you have to do is surrender it to Him. God, help me with this. But you have to really mean it. And when you really mean it, God's not just going to leave you the way you are. He's going to transform you. That's why the Bible says that we are a new creation, new life. Amen? We're a new creation. But it's not up to me to change you. It's God. The God that does the changing. Amen? Let's go to Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 10. I think I already read that. No, let's go to uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had and said he would not bring upon them, and he did not do it. So God saw that they all repented, that they all changed their evil ways, and God's plan was to destroy that whole city. Amen? And God changed his mind. God said, okay, they are all repented. They're all turned from their evil ways. I'm not going to destroy the city. I mean, that's powerful. Amen? You know, a lot of people think, well, God still punishes people. Sometimes he does. But you know, it's not like the minute you sin, okay, you're, I'm going to punish you. No. It's it's repetitious and repetitious and pushing the Holy Spirit away and pushing the Holy Spirit away where God finally says, you know what? I need to get your attention one way or another. He allows a certain disaster to happen in our life to wake us up. That's a spiritual spanking, right? But God saw that they all repented and said, I'm not going to destroy the city. That's a lot of people. 120,000 people, is that what I said? That's a lot of people that changed and one day gave their lives to God. And they were serious about it too. Church, we have a work to do. There's power in the name of Jesus. But you may ask, you want me to help to for who to be you want me to save who? Or you want Jesus to save everybody? Right? Does everybody, I guess what I'm trying to say is, are we just going to go to our family? Are we just going to go to those close to us and tell them about Jesus? Or do we need to get out of a comfort zone and tell everybody? Everybody, everybody amen? amen? Let's go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, 3, and 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Not just mad, but angry, right? Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4, Then he said, It is it right for you to... And then the Lord said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah is upset. What's going on here? What's going on here? Jonah, yes, 
Jonah was jealous. Jonah is mad that all these people that look different than the church are coming to the church now. They have long hair, men have long hair. They have all these piercings in their bodies. They have all these tattoos. They pull up in Harley Davidsons. They show up in low riders. <laughs> they show up to the church and they come to the church. And they don't look like us, right? They look different than us. That's what was wrong with Jonah. He says, I've been serving you, God, all my life. And you want me to save who? You want these people to be saved? And they're coming to the church. And he's upset. He's angry. I don't want them to, to be in here with us. They're dirty. They look different. Why would you want to save them, Lord? I don't know. That just blows my mind that people would think that way, right? But we see that today, right? We see that in the churches today. That's why I say come as you are. You're wearing shorts, come to church. Yes, with time, the Lord's going to impress to you to dress better. But come as you are. If you just got drunk last night and you have a hangover, come to church. The Lord will speak to you. He will do the change in you. Amen? I'm not here to judge you. God is the one that helps us. Amen? So he's angry. He don't want these people to be saved. Do we want only certain people to be saved while people are dying out in the streets? While this world is lost out here in the streets? We only want certain people to be saved because they wear a, a suit or because they look Christian. What does it mean to look Christian? <laughs> what does it mean to look Christian? To be Christ-like. That's what it means to be Christian. It doesn't mean you have to wear this long dress or this skirt or this uh, suit, right? What it means to be Christian is to follow Christ and to love everybody regardless of what they look like. Amen? We think about the Jewish people during Jesus' time. Amen? They love the church more than they love God. They love the temple more than they love God. They love Jerusalem more than they love God. So when Jesus was trying to reach to the Jewish people, they were caught up in tradition of the church, in traditions of the synagogue, right? And that's what we do in the churches today. We rather follow the traditions of the church. Sit up, stand down, uh, stand up, sit down, kneel down, stand up. <laughs> We're doing a workout in the church, right? Uh, we come marching in the church, and we march out of the church, and I'm the elder, I'm the deacon, and I'm the greeter, and we get, we get caught up in all these traditions. No, we're here to praise God, right? It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And that's what the Jewish people did. You know, Jesus, the Jewish people were God's chosen people. But they dropped the ball. They dropped the ball because they were caught up in their traditions. They were caught up in what they wanted to do, not what God wanted them to do. But Jesus was Jewish too. And he came to show the Jewish and the Christians the way to serve him, the way to follow him. And that's what we're here to do. Amen? That, that song this morning, the Israelite song, that just brought chills to me because... It really helped me out, man. You know, we're spiritual Jews. We're spiritual Israelites. And we're here to follow what the Word of God has for us. You know, the apostles preached during Pentecost. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of Gentiles and a lot of pagans and a lot of Romans and even Jewish people converted to Christianity. It says after Pentecost, you know, when uh, they begin to speak in tongues, in, in uh, real languages, by the way, not babbling, not gibberish, real languages, that the Holy Spirit gave these apostles the ability to speak in other languages. 
Why? Because there was people from all over the world there. And the apostles, maybe the most languages they knew how to speak was three languages. So how are they going to preach to all these people? God had to make a miracle happen. So he gave them the ability to speak all these different languages. It was, it was supernatural, but it was real languages. It was not the gibberish and babbling we see in the church today. That is a false Holy Spirit. That is a demonic spirit. And we don't want to get caught up in that. But God used the apostles to spread the gospel. Now the church is joined. Their people are converting by the thousands. It says that the, the church daily was getting full. Amen? But guess what? Who was in charge of the churches then? The Jewish people. They had the synagogues. The Jewish people had the synagogues. So now, guess who's coming into the church? The Gentiles, the Romans, the pagans. Because they have accepted Jesus Christ into the church. And the Jewish people are like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you circumcised? What are you doing here? <laughs> are you, did you just buy meat? From the, that meat that was offered to pagans, to, to the false gods? What are you doing here? Why aren't you wearing this? And why are you dressed like this? Why is your beard shaved? What are you doing here? That's exactly what the Jewish people were doing. Because they had the churches. They had the synagogues. And when after Pentecost, all these people were converting to Christianity, they were pouring in into the synagogues. And the Jewish people were in charge. And that's why Paul has to step in. Paul. Because Paul was Jewish, but raised Roman. So he understood both sides. He understood the world side. He understood the streets. He was street smart, but he was also raised in the ways of God. So Paul had to step in between the Jewish and the Christians and the Gentiles and say, hold on, why are we all fighting? Why are we all fighting? But he was stricter on the Jewish people. He's saying, you know what? You don't have to be circumcised no more. That was, that was, a, that was a feast. That was the, the old law. Amen? As long as you're circumcised in the heart. Amen? So what if they bought meat uh, offered to idols? They didn't. Did you offer it to an idol? No. You just bought the meat, right? You know, so Paul had to step in and say, guys, guys, we need to figure this out. It's about Jesus Christ. We're all Christians now. And a lot of the Jewish people didn't like it. That's what happened with Jonah. All these people converted. He didn't like that they are all different. And so therefore we need to, um, we need to be there for everybody. Doesn't matter what they look like or where they come from, amen? Let's go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 5 and through 7. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Then there he made him a, himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah and it may be a shade for him and his head to deliver him from the, miser from the misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it damaged the plant that it withered away. Amen. So Jonah is still hoping that God's going to destroy the city. After God said, I'm not going to destroy the city. And that's what I mean, church. That's what I mean, friends. Is sometimes we still wish bad on people. You know? We, we see them that they're caught up in sin and we still wish bad on people. We are not to wish bad on people, right? Jonah was still wishing that God would destroy that city even though they had repented. He was sitting there and God still cared about Jonah. He made this plant grow. 
and give Jonah shade as he was sitting there having a self-pity party, right? He was sitting there and um, but then God saw that Jonah cared more about the plant than he did about the people. So God made a worm come out in the morning and destroyed the plant. Now the sun's beating on him, right? Sometimes we care more about things than we care about God's people. We should care about people's souls, amen? It reminds me of the story of the prodigal son, right? You know, uh, he left his father and he went into his sinful ways. He took what, the money that belonged to him. But yet when he was coming back, God, you know, God, or the, it's, a, it's a parable, but this, her, his dad ran to him, gave him a party, put a ring on his finger, right? And uh, was celebrating that he was lost, but now he's found. But what, what happened to his brother? He was jealous. The brother said, Dad, I have never disobeyed you. I have always kept your commandments. I have always followed you. And you have never even given me a party. Why are you giving him a party? He went and did all these things and came back. And you're going to give him a party? And that's sometimes... If you've been in the church all your life, good, awesome. But you know that you already belong to your father, right? Let us not be jealous for the people that are out lost and they come back to God. Amen. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which come up in the night and perish in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock? Jesus is telling Jonah, you feel more bad for this plant? rather than for 120,000 people that gave their lives to me, and they don't, they don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand, these people were probably big time lost. They, they were not the smartest people, I guess you could say, right? But now they want to serve God. So let us think about that. We have a mission, miss, we have a mission church. With my final verse, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Book of Matthew chapter 28. 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has, given, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So we have a job, church. We have a mission. Amen. Amen. We are to go to all the world. There's a big thing going on right now. And it affects us that, you know, that if you're Hispanic, you know, whether you were born here in the United States or you were not born in the United States. That's politics, right? When people come to us in a church, we are to leave politics out of the church. Amen? Because the Bible says that he, he's there for the immigrants, the illegals, everybody. We are to lead people to Christ. I don't care if you're illegal or legal. Amen? And you know, there's a big mess going on right now with that. And it has affected even... You know, I know people attack me, and I, was, I wasn't even born in Mexico. I was raised in Mexico. But you know, it's a big discrimination thing going on right now. And a lot of churches are starting to look down at, you know, and bring politics in the church. We are to leave those things out. Amen? It says here, go to all nations, tongues, and people. All tribes. We are to go 
to every single person in the city. Amen? You know, a lot of people want to do mission work in Africa or in China. But yet, they don't want to go to their neighbor. They don't want to go here in the streets of Amarillo. We have mission work to do here in the streets of Amarillo. And that is my, that is, that is my prayer, that we all have that genuine love and be passionate to save souls. Amen? We are to go to everybody. And I want to just want to thank you, every person here today. Thank you for coming to church faithfully. Um, I know it's not easy. I know things come up. But you continue to be faithful to God and he will make a way for you. Whether it's your job, you're struggling with your job, they don't want to give you the Sabbath off. Whether it's uh, having problems at home with your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse, wife, husband. Whether it's problems at your, uh, with your health. You might have all kinds of health problems. You continue to be faithful to God. You, The Bible says... Look first to the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. He will transform you. He'll make a way. He'll open a door for you. Amen? He will open a door for you. You just continue to be faithful for Him. I just felt impressed to give a quick quick little testimony and I'll finish. I was going to... Um, I haven't worked the Sabbath in probably about 16 years now. I haven't worked on the Sabbath probably about 16 years now. And I uh, I was going to, uh, I was working for this job. I was there three years, three and a half years. And I got along with everybody there and they, they loved the work that I did. You know, whenever they told me to do whatever they needed me to do, I was ready to do it. They would put me on call. I was working for a medical company and I had a medical van and I traveled all over the Panhandle, all the way to Oklahoma, all the way to New Mexico, and every day just driving and going to people's houses, setting them up with oxygen and medical treatments, hospital beds, and a lot of other things. And so, but I told them from the beginning, I'm not gonna work on the Sabbath. I'm not gonna work on Saturday. And when it came, and uh, so I would work that person Sunday, and they would work my Saturday, right? So I was there th th three and a half years, and then all of a sudden, the boss's wife, it was not even my own boss, his wife started to have beef with me, started to have problems with me, which it was the husband one that was in charge of the business. Me and him got along. And he had a brother that worked for him. We all got along. And we all, you know, they, we would always talk and we, we got along. They appreciated everything I did. But the boss's wife had a problem with me. And uh, she, she knew what I believed. She knew that I kept the Sabbath holy. She knew that I didn't eat pork and all these other things, right? So she started to uh, bring her pastor from her church to work. And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> so we would have meetings every other day there at work. And she would have his, her pastor come to the meetings and say a little something. And uh, I knew something was coming up. I knew something was going on and I knew it was because of me. And uh, therefore she continued to do that. And then uh, she got a book. Because they had a bookshelf there. And it says, Why do Christians keep the Sabbath holy? And she had it on a bookshelf there. I'm like, why, why is that book there? <laughs> so eventually it got to the point where she called me into her office because she was more in charge of the of the pharmacy. He was in charge, her husband was in charge of the medical, right? And, uh, well, before she called me to her office, she had um, her husband's brother talk to me. And, they, and he called me in there. He goes, I'm going to need you to, I'm going to need you to work Saturdays from now on. It's not fair that all these guys are working Saturdays and you're not. 
I go, I know, but I, we made this agreement before I started working here. I've been working for what, three, three and a half years now, and I've never worked a Saturday. I know, I know, but maybe other, every other Saturday. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna work any Saturdays. And um, okay, okay, I'll talk to, I'll talk to, um, you know, the boss, my brother. Like, all right, but I knew it wasn't the boss. I knew it wasn't the boss, it was his wife. And a week passed, and she called me into her office. And uh, she was like, Juan, I wanna tell you thank you for everything that you've been working, you're a hard worker, and thank you, but I need you to work Saturdays from now on. I said, I said I'm sorry, with much respect, that's what I believe, and she raised her voice. You know, she didn't even let me finish. I said, I'm gonna, t I'm telling you, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, you're gonna work Saturdays from now on. And then she told me on a Friday. She goes, so tomorrow I need you to be here. Tomorrow I need you to be here at work. And I go, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be here. I'm like, all right, we'll see, we'll see. So, um, there was a lot more said. So the next day came, of course, I was at church. <laughs> I was at church. I brought it up before the church. People prayed for me. And um, come Monday morning, they, they pulled me into the office. Or she did. And why didn't you come to work? I'm like, you know why. You know why. Well, Sabbath is holy. God commands us to keep the Sabbath holy. He says, okay, okay, will you remain in here? Let me go talk to my husband. And they talked for like two hours. I'm not exaggerating. I was in that office for a whole two hours. <laughs> and then, yes, they did. I was there for two hours, and uh, finally she comes out. I need your badge. I need uh, your keys, I need everything. Um, here's all your stuff from your desk, because I had a desk. Here's all your stuff. Um, thank you for working for us, but you no longer have a job here. And it was crazy. As I was walking out, I saw her husband, he was crying. Her husband was crying because he knew how we were close and how dedicated I was to working for them. And he knew that he had allowed her to make the decision rather than him make the decision. And uh, so I got fired. Um, people started going against me. Even, I don't know, even the person that I was with at that time started going against me like, you just got fired. You should have just took. You should have just kept working on Saturday. I'm like, no. I'm here to serve God, no matter what. Amen. And it was, it was, it was around that time. I don't know if y'all remember during that time here in Amarillo, where there was nobody hiring anybody. I was applying everywhere. Even I, I even got to the point where I started applying to restaurants. And um, I didn't have a job for about. A whole year but I remember I remember but you know what even even not having that job for the whole year I had bills right I was paying child support too I'm still paying child support <laughs> and uh, it was for my other daughter by the way <laughs> um, I asked I had to make payments guess what I was doing I was still getting up I was mowing, mowing lawns, mowing yards. I was cutting grass. I was getting up at six in the morning and going and applying at jobs. So you didn't get unemployment? I, w I went after unemployment. I was doing all those things. I was, I was doing everything that I needed to do. I could have easily gave up and said, well, you know, I'm not gonna work. But you know us men, sometimes us men, we give a bad reputation for other men out there. 
We are to be hardworking, amen? We are to be dedicated and provide for our families, amen? But you know what? I remain faithful to God, and I had job opportunities. Osarco wanted to hire me for like $19 an hour, and back then, that was a lot. That was a, that was a long time ago. Now they pay more. And they said, we'll hire you, but I need you to, I need you to work every other Saturday. So you're hired. They told me I was hired. I went to the interview and everything because a friend of mine helped me to get an interview with Osarco. I was all excited. I went to the, to the you know, everything, to, to the interview and everything. You're hired. We just needed you to work. No, they said one Saturday out of the month. That's what they told me. We just need you to work one Saturday out of the month. No, I'm sorry. Thank you for the offer, but I can't do it because that's a Sabbath and I like, all right. Well, we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll give you a call. They never called me back. They never called me back. A lot of people in my family and friends were like, you're crazy. You just turned down a job that's gonna pay you that much. I'm like, yeah, I'd rather be faithful to God, amen? When you're faithful to God, God's going to make a way for you. You know what happened? God sent this doctor, this doctor that I know. He said, I, I know, I heard what happened. He heard it in church. I know what happened to you. Therefore, I'm going to give you a couple of thousand dollars to pay for anything that you need that you're going through. I was, I was in shock. But... God provided. Amen? And then not too far after that, I got a job. I got a job for a concrete place Monday through Friday. And then after that, I went and back, did the same kind of work for another company, but I didn't have to work Saturdays. And now I'm where I'm at, and I don't have to work Saturdays. I worked at Walmart. I didn't have to work Saturdays. A lot of people are like, you're the only person that does not work on Saturdays. Like, because God makes a way. God will make a way. If you get fired, so what? God has something else for you. Amen? Let's continue to be faithful for God. I'm sorry, I just felt impressed to share that with you guys. And uh, God loves you very much. We have a job to do. God's going to fill this church up, guys. God's going to fill this church up. And if we get kicked out from this church, we'll find another place to meet. We're, we're not worried about that, right? We're here to preach the truth. We're here to serve God. We're not here to follow traditions. Amen? So let us pray. Let us stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, you have spoken to us today. Lord, give us the strength. We call on to you, Father. We call out to you, Father. And you tell us that if we call out to you, that you will give us strength like eagle's wings. And that we will be able to run and we won't get tired. But the type of running I, we know that you're talking about, Lord, is to share the gospel with everyone. To be there for our people. But not just share the gospel, not just show them that we care, but also show them truth. The truth found in your word in the Bible the truth about your Ten Commandments, the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about everything else that's in the Word. Father, let us not grow weary. Let us not get bored with you, Lord. But revive us. Give us that passion to serve you no matter what. We just, we love you, Father. And we pray for those that weren't able to make it, that are at home, whether they're sick, whether they're facing depression, whether they're facing uh, doubt, Whatever they're facing, Lord, we ask that you intercede and be there for them, Lord, and speak to their heart. Lord, bless your church. Bless us. We ask for that blessing, Father. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Before you play that song, Rick, I uh, just want to tell you guys, we're going to have Pastor Jesse here next Saturday. I need y'all's help.